Uh, hey, everyone, this is Steve with Collider, and I'm here in Park City at our Sundance studio. Um, I really want to, before we get started in talking about your doc, I want to give a huge thank you to Filmio for being our sponsor. We would not be able to be here supporting independent cinema without them. Um, and for people that don't know, uh, Filmio is shattering barriers by placing the power to greenlight films in the hands of creators and fans. And you can learn a lot more about them by visiting their website, film.io. How are you guys doing? Okay. Yeah, happy I, to be here. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I uh, really, uh, you guys know it costs a lot of money to do things, especially with movies and everything else. I'm hugely grateful to them for allowing us to be here. Um, so I have about a thousand questions for the two of you. Uh, I first want to start with um, a lot of people know uh, Mavis, mm -hmm. but they don't know the documentary yet. Mm -hmm. So how have you been explaining it to friends and family? Um, so the last time I explained it, I was on... Uh, the air, I was in the airport, my layover on the way to here, mm -hmm. um, and met a very lovely woman who lives in Park, not Park City, who lives in Salt Lake City, and I said that we were um, investigating the legacy of a really well-loved figure in black technological history, um, and then I said also that she um, is both not real um, and also very real in the hearts and minds of people, right? Mavis Beacon as a really core childhood memory for a lot of people. And so I think um, kind of connecting um, both like our research into like the making of like this very like mythological figure, like this typing prodigy, um, but then also at the same time, like trying to get deeper into the meat of like the labor behind creating who she became a lot of that labor was like done by a black femme who we felt like didn't entirely get what she deserved or we weren't sure if she did and we wanted to check we wanted to know for sure because yeah the impact the impact of her work was so great um and so it kind of follows jasmine and i on a bit of a goose chase um to try and get an, get an interview with the the woman who lent her face and body to, yeah, the embodiment of Mavis Beacon and Renee Lesperance. So one of the things is making any film is very challenging. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, how tough was it to get this off the ground in terms of getting some sort of financing? And how much was it you guys just doing it on your own? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. I'm, I'd love to talk about the process. I mean, the film is all about process. Um, I think it's worth naming. This was in development for two years, just with me applying and applying to different grants. And it was truly the moment that I found Olivia as a collaborator and she agreed to join the project and also um, my producer, Getty Feline at Bell Moon. Um, it was actually, like there's power in numbers. So the moment that they joined this project, it felt like everything was getting greenlit. Um, it also was in 2020 at a really contentious time where a lot of film institutions were like, maybe we will listen to what these black filmmakers have to say. <laughs> um, so I think that was super advantageous to us. And we, you know, we we are aware of the stakes of this project and the fact that um, it was probably greenlit given the brutalization that black people were facing in 2020. One of the things about this project is I really felt your obsession while I was watching. And um, did you, uh, can you look back on it? Like, uh, did you feel... The obsession, because it felt like, you, you know what I mean? Like, I, I felt like, I don't want to, I don't know how, like, you were almost losing yourself a little bit mm -hmm. in, 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 that's the way I felt while watching it, in trying to get answers and make, you know what I mean? No, totally. Uh, we have an interview subject in the film who's a writer, Shola von Reinholdt, and she uses this term in her writing, transfictions, to describe what was happening there, uh, which is essentially an obsession. And yeah, it got really meta. Uh, the space and the headquarters that you see in the film wasn't just a location for shooting. It was truly where we were working. Um, and so I was editing, you know, proof of concepts in the exact same headquarters. Um, and it's been about five years of talking about Mavis Beacon every day. I didn't know the process would take this long. And I'm happy to say I actually really love Mavis Beacon. Um, and I'm never sick of talking about the character. <laughs> well, one of the things I think that a lot, when I mentioned you guys were coming in for this doc, everyone or a lot of people knew the typing software or had heard yeah. of her. And I'm just sort of curious, if, like for people that don't realize, can you sort of talk about the impact of this software and Mavis in, especially in, in like the black community, mm -hmm. but, but also also, just in general, it was a very impactful piece of software. Yeah, 
No, Mavis Beacon teaches typing, I think sold like maybe 15 million copies. It's a crazy number. Yeah. Uh, on the order of millions. Don't don't quote me on 15. When they stopped <laughs> tracking the numbers, it was 10 million. So yeah. given the amount of time and the, the fact that people are still free downloading, you know, Mavis Beacon online. Open source, archive.org. Um, you know, it came out in around 1987, I think was the first like launch where people were able to order it online. And I think there was just one New York Times review and it was flying off the shelves. And it was at a time where people were really like getting used to the concept of computers being inside of their homes and not just being things that scientists use or people in business use. It was around the same time that like um, Apple had their like crazy Super Bowl commercial mm -hmm. for like 1984. Like there was a lot of just like collective consciousness about like, oh my God, computers are here, the internet is coming. Um, and Mavis Beacon was a lot of people's like first like entry point to like becoming a part of modernity in that way. And so like for whether it was school age children or like working adults who were like, okay, shoot, like I have a new skill that I need to learn because of the like enormous popularity of the software from like the late 80s all the way into the late 90s and potentially like a little bit more into the early 2000s, it was like the main way that people really like came to know like came to embody themselves physically and like engage with computers in a way that empowered them like to go from like hunt and pecking to like really like being all like maestro <laughs> on the keys <laughs> is a very like affirming experience that makes you feel like oh, okay I'm not like just some like schmuck who doesn't know how computers work sitting in front of the computer like I actually am in command of this machine sure. and I think like the feeling of being in command of a machine that up until that point was very alien to you um, actually plays a really big role in like your confidence and your ability to like yeah, participate in the digital landscape in a way that you couldn't before. Sure. I, I'm fascinated by the editing process because, and especially on a documentary, because that, so talk a little bit about how did you ultimately decide on some of the, on putting it together and the storylines, because you, were there any storylines that you ultimately pulled out? How did you dis, like discover the right runtime? Mm. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. and was there, and, and this is part three, but was there anything that you were like, we just, this is too personal or I can't include this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the edit, it I would say we've been editing for two years lightly and one year seriously. Um, so our editor, John, as Olivia and I were still conducting the search and on the investigation was ingesting the footage and he put together an assembly that was chronological and I hated it. Uh, he was great, you know, but it was just like, it was so much of us. I thought we were so obnoxious and navel gazy. <laughs> I'm like, we have to cut a lot of this. Um, and so basically John uh, Fine, Yelen Cohen and I at the start of summer had an upstate retreat and we just started arcing out like, how could this go? How can we break up this linear thing um, and still have it be reflective and truthful of what we experienced? Uh, what's interesting is that the actual like, um, the interviews that you see with the people who are involved in making the software, all of that does unfold chronologically. In terms of like plot lines, it's hard to believe. Uh, I'm, it's a personal doc. I, you know, I'm a very emotional person. Uh, and so we actually cut some of the scenes with me crying just because we're like, this is a bummer. <laughs> um, and it was just like within the span of an hour and a half, it's like you can only cry so many times before people are just like, okay, wrap it up. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, so I would say we cut out some of the crying. Um, the idea of Olivia going back to school, I'll let you speak to that, but you know, she's <laughs> coming of age and questioning going back to school, and that was truly unfolding with the doc. Um, and so when we ended filming, you know, Olivia got into college and it was a great heroic story of like, yay, back to education. Um, but you know, you can speak to this. It didn't actually reflect where Olivia was at in her thinking about school. So we opened that up to kind of reflect this other thing where she departs from academia. Um, and I'm really excited about that plot line because I do think we're so used to seeing these like brilliant young black femmes who, you know, are geniuses and go off to school. And I think Olivia is a genius and is brilliant, um, but doesn't source that that brilliance in academic institution and all of that. So I'm yeah. just really great to see that. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, I feel like um, there's definitely like trying to figure out like what our character like 
arcs would be in terms of like making the film make sense because we realized quickly like the arc wouldn't be us talking to Renee and so we had to like kind of go on a journey I mean we were going on journeys internally but like in order to kind of create a sense of satisfaction I think um, it was helpful to kind of have our own like internal worlds be like starting someplace else ending someplace else and I think like yours is kind of like very like emotional in terms of like getting to, to a point of peace. Acceptance, Acceptance for me. <laughs> Olivia definitely it. accepts things sooner than I do in the Versus film. Versus I'm like fully just growing up. Like I go from 18 to 20, I'm 22 now. We started this when I was 18. I like, I bleach my brows. I like turn 21. I get COVID a few times. Like there's a sense of like real, like several like personal just revolutions of like growing up very quickly happen in this space, I think. And I think also at the same time, um, I learned a lot about like learning <laughs> and like what curi like what curiosity I think meant to me. And I think after like encountering just like the learning style of like being on set and being in an active investigation and like pulling pulling at these threads and like having to be like a real autodidact I think and just in the process of working the idea of going back to school afterwards and being in an environment that does not necessarily like encourage creativity or like individual thought and like kind of wants you to like be like um not a not a robot that's not quite fair because I was applying to BFA programs that were interested in artistic craft but not necessarily like <laughs> it was just the vibe wasn't hitting the vibe wasn't hitting anymore um, well, and yeah. my goals changed a lot I was just gonna say like I think that college and school is very important especially for some degrees and and yeah. things that you want to pursue and in other ways it's a lot of money that maybe doesn't give you a, a reward money. yeah yeah, and I think Olivia is a testament to like someone who, I mean, she's doing theoretical work. We're citing concepts that Olivia has coined at the age of 18, you know, this term of like being a cyber doula or someone who stewards a healthy relationship to technology. Uh, she's being cited in the texts of the people <laughs> that we're interviewing. So I think it's kind of a, it's been really fascinating to watch Olivia's growth. And I think she has more of an outward arc that you can track by these moments in her life, whereas mine is an internal arc of denial. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely want to talk about the fact that, uh, and like the doc does such a great job at really pulling back uh, who Mavis Beacon was and Renee and everything else. But uh, for people that don't realize, ma let's just touch on real quick. Uh, Mavis is a creation of three white men mm -hmm. right. and who, you know, saw a, someone saw a woman put on the cover. Uh, so, A, could you sort of talk about that? And B, do you think that the software without like you take Renee off that software and maybe it's nothing? You know, it's like Renee's face was so integral in this software's success. It's very true. Um, actually, there were other typing softwares on the market, actually, at the same time that did have, like, kind of spokes people, but not necessarily a real person on the cover. Like, they would invent, like, let me not, I think I was going to be like Lisa, but I don't think the name was Lisa, but like there, there were, com they, were they had competitors. Um, and there was a big sense, I think at the out outset when they released the software and people were a bit like jarred by the presence of like a black woman on the shelves. Like they didn't, they weren't selling well initially. Um, and then, and then there was a shift to all of a sudden they were getting like so many orders they couldn't handle it. Um, and I think there's definitely a sense of like, um, a lot of people would like call and like ask for Mavis Beacon to like come speak at their school <laughs> and like give like very like there was a sense of like this is a celebrity endorsement of a software um, and that that's why she's like incorporated and not that this was like a figure of marketing. It didn't really they didn't really pivot their marketing strategy to being very clear that she was fake until after the lawsuit and after like it became like, oh, maybe it's a bit. Like maybe we've given too much power away by allowing like this person who's like not part of the company to like be so synonymous with the software. But there's definitely like, um, I think, yeah, the ability to accept this like introduction of new technology into your house by having like a friendly face and one that many people thought was like beautiful mm -hmm. and like dressed in business wear and like and it goes it can play either way. I think what's really brilliant about the marketing of it, especially when you're like 
or late 80s, you know, you've got the Cosbys on television. There's this image of like a black middle class. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, look, if you're pro black, you're like, that's a black woman on the cover. I'm buying it. If you also have a contentious relationship to blackness, you, she's in a subservient position. So she's there to help you do a thing. Um, so I do think it was a bit of a um, Mandy Harris Williams, our interview subject, ref- described it as a culture gem. Uh, I think she's a culture gem. And I don't think we would be having this conversation if she wasn't black. And, you know, I have a lot of feelings about that casting choice, but ultimately I'm really grateful. And the whole reason I was interested in this project was like, we don't have enough role models of black people in technology. Like there are so many of our stories at the onset of building these things that just weren't accounted for and are not archived. So that's where I was like, whether or not she's real, I need all the role models I can get. So let's flesh this out a bit and figure out who the real person Person is. Yeah, and a, like to like a prioritization or just like to hold an equal weight kind of these soft skills. And it's like whether or not Renee was like in the process of like coding the thing, like not necessarily, but the fact of the matter is is that her presence and the labor that she performed like are a reason why the work was successful. And I think women, black women, and, and just in general who might be working in technology and are in kind of more like what is considered softer roles that are either like more people facing or like are solving different kinds of problems that might not be technical, but are still problems that get in the way of the work being done, oftentimes like are discredited and are not given like the same level of priority and respect that their peers who might be assumed to be more skilled at technical things because of patriarchy are given more respect in those ways. So I think it's also cool that we're able to like, to have like, yes, this is a role model in technology history, despite not being a computer scientist. I, one of the things I'm sure you've noticed by now is I'm trying not to give away anything from the doc. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to promote while not, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that you guys did in the doc is you, you know, had TikTok things, videos, like it, 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 it's a, it feels new and fresh. Can you sort of talk about the aesthetic and, you know, the importance of having like modern social clips mm. inside all the footage? Yeah, I think um, I've described this film as kind of the baby of somebody who watches like too much, like hate watches true crime while scrolling on TikTok, learning about critical race theory. So it's like all of those things are present in this film. Um, I think so much we attribute, you know, it's deeply referential. Uh, Olivia has encouraged me. I'm like, are we are we citing too many sources? And she's like, no, this is just a part of like feminist praxis of like citing the sources that come before you. And so you know, I, lineage. It's we're part of a lineage. And so I'm really grateful not only to shout out, you know, um, the Sadia Hartmans and Cheryl Denny's that are inspiring this work, but also like the black vloggers and TikTokers who are putting an incredible amount of time and research um, into this. And also, you know, um, I love the phrase like the revolution must be like irresistible or sexy. And I think that people online, the black internet, they're so good at taking these really difficult subjects and adding humor to it. And so that was something where we're like, we know we're making a film that can potentially have a really, really bad ending and a really sad ending. So we want to approach this with as much levity as possible. Um, not going to spoil the ending. It's definitely it's not as sad and bad as we were prepared for. Um, but we're dealing with some pretty heavy themes here. And I think the Internet just has a way of making that medicine go down a bit easier. Yeah, There was definitely a version of the film that we tried to stay away from in terms of like, yeah, searching for like a missing black woman, like black women go missing all the time. And like no one really looks for them, not in the way that would like guarantee their safety and like being brought home in a reasonable time frame. And I think um, there is a sense of like while we were filming, like there was a lot of like just even like news about like women who like would be like going missing or just like it was it was a kind of time where that was very top of mind as well. And so we were like, how do we talk about this? and be like not like super depressing and also like acknowledge the fact that like we keep us safe and like all of these people are very comfortable saying like oh like we haven't heard from her in a while but like I'm sure she's fine and we are like actually like no like why don't you just look and why hasn't anyone looked and come to the realization that like maybe like yeah like maybe we are the ones we were waiting for. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm just about out of time with you and I have to wrap, but I'm just going to say, obviously you guys were very successful working together. So is it one of these things where 
um, you know, are there other ideas that we want to pursue? <laughs> oh, Do you see what I mean? I mean, Olivia does have a life to live. I, <laughs> I mean, look, she's brilliant and, and has made this project so much more thorough. Um, also, I think like we are truly family at this point and like our friendship was not just for the movie. Like we're, <laughs> that's my sister. So, and there's also so many other mysteries we've uncovered. So look, if someone wants to fund us, like I have questions. We have a lot of pop culture questions. What, what was Aretha Franklin filming on that camera? <laughs> where did Hattie McDaniel's Oscar go? Was Betty Bloop a black woman? Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to fund that, there's absolutely room for a spinoff series. Um, but I think we're going to sleep a little bit, maybe. <laughs> Allegedly. I don't think Allegedly. you have the ability to shut down. I, I, <laughs> watching you in this movie, I'm like, I, I think that uh, you, you're not shutting down. No, you'll probably see us um, at the next Sundance. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I have a, well, listen, I really want to say congrats on the film and congrats on getting in Sundance. And I really do, I'm assuming it's for sale. Or is it? It's a, you know, it's an interesting thing. Neon, they're a sales company, and this is a very unique project that they entered at the production level. It sounds like there's a strong possibility of a theatrical run, and then we're figuring out where to stream it. That sounds awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking to us and yeah, your thoughtful awesome. questions. Yeah. Uh, listen, I, I really say congrats, and I'm so happy you guys made it. And um, Thank you for being at Sundance and to everyone watching. Thank you uh, for supporting Collider, blah, blah, blah. But mostly I want to give again a huge thank you to Filmio for being our sponsor because with them, we are able to talk to you uh, about your documentary. Thank you, Filmio. Thank you, Collider. Uh, On that note, have a great day, everyone. Thanks.